Good morning, brothers and sisters. Welcome to the house of the Lord, which we call Fourth Avenue United Methodist Church. Everybody, welcome. It's great to see all of you, all of you that are here today with us. And those of you that are with us, joining us uh, either via your uh, devices or your phone, you're also welcome to the house of the Lord. It's great to have everybody here today. Uh, I want to start off by sharing some announcements. Uh, the first one being that um, the Give for Good in Louisville uh, will be the 15th of September. So uh, we're asking everybody to please make sure that you circle that. And it's a good time for you to give, not just for many things in Louisville, but specifically for our open door ministry here in, in Fourth Avenue. So please, uh, please be remembering that. And also, we are collecting cans still for the, um, the food, uh, um, I'm sorry, the food pantry uh, here, uh, in our, in our uh, neighborhood. So please continue to bring in some cans. Uh, I believe this is the last week that we will be doing it. But uh, please bring, uh, bring them in and, and feel free to do that. Um, with that in mind, let us come to the Lord. In prayer. When our prayer is found in our programs, and it says, O Lord, our God, you are worthy of all our praise. You are the God who never fails to keep his promises. We thank you that in Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, we see your love justice, mercy, provision, and victory. You are the God who lifts up those who are weighted down. You are the God who provides for your children. Our desire is to praise you as long as we live, inhabit our praises as we gather together today through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us open our hymn books to hymn number 154, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. We will be singing verse 1, 3, 4, and 6. name let angels prostrate fall bring forth the royal diadem and crown him lord of all bring forth the royal diadem and crown him lord of all sinners whose love can ne'er forget Spread your trophies at his feet and crown him Lord of all. Go spread your trophies at his feet and crown him Lord of all. Let every kindred, every tribe on this terrestrial ball to him all majesty ascribe and crown him lord of all to him all majesty ascribe and crown him lord of all number six oh with and yonder sacred throng we at his feet may fall Extol the still everlasting song and crown him, Lord of all. We'll join the everlasting song and crown him, Lord of all. Let us come to the Lord in prayer, brothers and sisters. 
Lord, as we come here today, this morning, we want to thank you, God, for everything you have given us, for the rain that provides everything we need for our plants to grow and cool us down in the hot day. For the hot days, God, that give us the warmth that allow us to do so many things. And Lord, I want to thank you, God, for the opportunity to be here glorifying your name and praising your name, God. For we know, God, that there are many that wish that could do it today but are not able to. So Lord, I ask for those that are not with us today because they are ill. I ask that your holy hand touch their bodies at this time. May they know that your church is praying for them, God. May they know, God, that at this time, there is people that love them, that are stretching out, not just their hand, but their love towards them. And Lord, I ask for those that are outside of our walls, that maybe they don't know that they too can worship you. Maybe they feel that they can't. Maybe they feel that they're not wanted. But Lord, I ask that you move in us and stir us, God. Stir our hearts so that we may actually feel the need to go out and be among them and live life together, God. Allow us, God, to be one family in the heart of the city. So, Lord, we thank you for everything you give us. We thank you for allowing us to worship you. And we pray, God, that you continue to move in our hearts, continue to move in our spirit, continue to move in our minds so that we may be your, your love in the heart of the city. Ask this in your name. Amen. If we could please open our hymnals to hymn number 140, Greatest Thy Faithfulness, hymn number 140.
Good morning, brothers and sisters. Welcome once again to Fourth Avenue United Methodist Church. It is great to be worshiping together here once again in God's uh, house. For those of you that have not had the pleasure of meeting, my name is Jose Gonzalez, and it is a pleasure to be here with you. I am the pastor at Fourth Avenue, and I'm glad that, that you are here with us. I'm going to be reading the scripture from Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. Once again, it's found in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. I will re be reading the word of God in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The word of God says, for this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derive its name. I pray that out of his glorious rich riches, he may strengthen you with power through the, his Holy Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your heart through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and how long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Not to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of God for us the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Now, brothers and sisters, we have been talking about being called by God. And in essence, last week we finished with the uh, fact that we have a new identity. That's what we are called to individually, to a new identity. And our new identity is called people. That is our new identity, no longer the identity that we had. And we learn that the reason why God calls us is so that we may actually be able to bring others to Christ. And we learn that how God calls us, it's in an individual way, but also as a church. And today we are talking about what the, does God calls us to corporately. Last week it was individually, this week will be corporately. What does God calls us to as a church. And with that in mind, I want us to come to the Lord in prayer. Lord, I come before you at this moment. Asking your Holy Spirit to come. Holy Spirit, come. For there are many things that are probably in our minds right now. And we may not be able to listen the message that you have for us today. So as we try, God, to put all those things away, all those comments that we heard, all those things that we forgot, all those things that we wish would be different. We ask, Lord, 
that you take control at this moment, wherever we may be, be it here at your temple, or be it at our home, in our car, wherever we are at this moment that we are hearing these words. May your Holy Spirit take control and may this place be holy because we are in the pre your presence, Lord. So Holy Spirit, make this place holy. Not just holy in the sense that we cannot come near it, but holy in the sense that we can be cleansed by you. Allow us to be in your presence. I ask this in your name. Amen. I don't know how many of you guys go and visit some of your friends or maybe your relatives or, or maybe even your parents. But whenever you come uh, and visit someone, there's always a custom of saying, make yourself at home. Am I right? I'm not, some of you don't have that custom and that's okay. <laughs> but, but some of you have heard that being said. Make yourself at home. And as a matter of fact, when I go and visit people uh, uh, as a pastor, they're like, come in, pastor, make yourself at home. And they, they want me to feel comfortable. That's what we're trying to say, right? But, I mean, as visitors, do we actually ever feel at home? <laughs> Bill's saying yes, but the majority of us are like, mm, no, that's, that's their bedroom. I'm not going in there. And before we get a glass of water, we ask, may I have a glass of water? So it's not really that we make ourselves at home. It's that we try to be comfortable in an uncomfortable situation. Now, brothers and sisters, Paul is speaking to a church in the, uh, the Ephesians, and he's speaking to them, and he's writing while he is a prisoner. And he's actually shackled to a soldier on one side and a soldier on the other side. How comfortable must he be? And Paul is writing all of this that we have read right now when he is shackled with two soldiers on each side. The reason why I ask this, brothers and sisters, how comfortable can you be, is because many times we come to church and we want to be comfortable. I don't know about you guys, but I like the fact that we have air conditioning. I want to be comfortable. I want to have comfy uh, seats. I want to be able to feel like I can sit here for an hour and I'll be okay. And when I come, I want to hear good music. I want to hear good words. But is that what God has called us to as a church? Some of you are like, maybe. <laughs> Look at what Paul is saying. Paul is saying, for this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derived their, its name. He's saying, for this reason, I kneel before the Father. I want to let you know, brothers and sisters, that it was not a custom to pray kneeling. Now for many Christians it is. But it was not the custom to pray kneeling. The custom was to pray standing up. And the custom was to pray with your hands up. 
That was the custom, to pray with your hands up, standing up. And Paul is saying, for this, reason, for this reason, right here, I'm willing to kneel down before the Father. Now, let me tell you, there's very few times that uh, a Hebrew actually knelt for prayer. Because kneeling for prayer, all of a sudden, had a different meaning. Kneeling for prayer, all of a sudden, became humbling yourselves. And Paul is saying, I am willing to humble myself for this. For this prayer that I'm praying for Christ's church. Now, how many of us, brothers and sisters, are willing to kneel for our brothers and sisters and humble ourselves for them? We're willing to do that because we know them. We're willing to do that because we're at church. <laughs> but what about when we're outside? What about for that person that we don't know? I've never met. Are we willing to humble ourselves for them? Because let me tell you, brothers and sisters, there was a time when all of us used to be people that were unknowns. There was a time when all of us were strangers. There was a time when all of us were foreigners to Christ. And now we are not, and we are blessed because of that. And we are able to have a family that surrounds us, and they are willing to humble themselves for us. But what about for those that are still not part of this group? Are we willing to kneel before Christ for that? Or are we still praying, standing up with our hands lifted up? Today's sermon is, what does God call us to corporately? What is God calling us to corporately? And Paul brings out three points that I want to bring out in this scripture. Number one is that we are called to corporately to be strengthened through God's spirit, which is found on verse 16. We are called to be strengthened in God's spirit. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to point out something here. If you read other versions of this same scripture, which I have, it doesn't actually say like it does in the NIV, which verse 16, it says, I pray that out of his glorious riches. In the majority of the uh, of the uh, the uh, different versions, it says, I pray that, um, I'm sorry, that according to the glory, uh, his glorious riches, according to his glorious riches. And you might be saying, well, that, that's similar, uh, Pastor, it's the same thing. Mm, yes and no. Here's the thing that I want to point out, brothers and sisters. If we are helping someone else out of what we have, then we're going to give them part of what we have. Amen? Right? If I have $40 and we're helping out someone with $20, we're giving them part of what we have, right? But if we're giving them according to what we have, we have $40 according to what, uh, what we have would be $40. According to God's riches would be all of God's riches, not part of God's riches. Here's the thing, brothers and sisters. Paul is asking for something that is, uh, uh, it's hard to understand. And, and Paul is asking this for the church, and we are called to that. We are called to be strengthened in God's spirit according to God's riches. 
In other words, brothers and sisters, we are called to have the same level of richness that God has. I'm not talking about money, brothers and sisters. I'm talking about spirit. Now, if you start thinking that way, imagine what you can do. There's a reason why Jesus said, you know, this things that I am doing, you will do even greater things. Jesus wasn't saying you will do the same thing that I did. Jesus was, uh, was saying you will do even greater things. Because you know what, brothers and sisters? God is not wanting to give us a part of his spirit. He wants to give it all of it. And brothers and sisters, that's what we are called to. We are called to receive all of God's spirit. I thought people were going to say amen. <laughs> we are called to receive all of God's spirit, brothers and sisters. And when you start thinking that way, then you actually start thinking differently. Because you no longer are thinking, I'm going to have part of God's spirit, which God's love is right here, so I'm going to be right here. And you're no longer thinking, I'm going to have part of God's spirit, so God's given us right here, so I'm going to be right here. You're no longer thinking, well, God gave all of himself for us, so I'm, God gave, gave this much, I'm going to give right here. It's a different way of thinking. It says, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. Now, this is very important, brothers and sisters. Paul is not saying your outer being, because your outer being is this, what you see, and what everybody else sees, and what everybody else hears. But your inner being is differently. It's different. Your inner being is your mind. Your inner being is your spirit. Your inner being is your soul. That's what Paul is asking for us to be strengthened. And that's what needs to be strengthened, brothers and sisters, because let me tell you, in this world, you will have trouble. But Jesus says, fear not, for I have conquered this world. And brothers and sisters, that's the inner uh, being that needs to be strengthened. Because brothers and sisters, we are weak beings. When we are sick, when we feel sick, sick, you know, it's hard for us to remember that, hey, there is power in the name of Jesus and we can be healed. When things are going wrong, it is hard for us to believe that there is power in the name of Jesus and this, uh, this uh, trouble, we will come out of it too. Because we are weak people, brothers and sisters. We are weak beings. And our being is so weak that our inner being needs to be strengthened. And this is what Paul is praying for. And this is what we have been are called to, brothers and sisters. We are called to receive all of God's uh, spirit, and we are called to be strengthened in our inner being. And by being that, that way, then we could actually be able to overcome. Overcome, brothers and sisters. We could actually start seeing that we are more than victorious. We could actually start seeing that this many people that are in church today is nothing because we could have more people here. We could actually start seeing how my, uh, my being can strengthen other people. And by strengthening them, then they will be attracted to this God that I have. 
Because I too was down. I too was weak. I too was poor. I too did not have all of God's spirit. So how are we going to do this? Well, the best way to do it, brothers and sisters, is the Wesleyan way that we learned a while back. Living life together. We spent several weeks, weeks learning about how we are supposed to come together in groups. If you remember, in large groups. In small groups, in groups that make us ask ourselves, how are you doing, really? That points out to the things that we need to work on. And brothers and sisters, when we start living life together, when we are able to lean on our brother and our sister and be able to know that they are willing to give themselves for us, then all of a sudden, I'm no longer as weak as I used to be because my inner being has been strengthened. I know that I could pick up the, uh, the phone and I could call and somebody will answer. I know that I could go and tell him my troubles and he won't be told to the rest of the congregation. My inner being is being strengthened when we come together. And you might be saying, well, I can come together wherever I am. And thank God that we have technology and we're able to do this wherever we may be. And yes, brothers and sisters, that is a great way of coming together. But brothers and sisters, it is also important for us to be together. To see your eyes. To hear your, uh, uh, your, your laugh. To see you smile. So the first thing that we are called to corporately is to be strengthened through God's spirit, all of it, according to his riches in glory. Not a portion of it, all of it. Verse 17 says, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love, 18, may have power together with all Lord's uh, holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. Brothers and sisters, we are called to be rooted and established in love. Rooted and established. Now, you, some of us might be saying, well, that's just repeating the, uh, the same thing. There's, you're basically saying the same thing. No. Here's the thing. Rooted means that you actually are getting life through that. That's what roots do. Roots get life through and nutrients through the soil and the water that's in the soil and everything else that's in the soil. That's what being rooted means. But being established means that you are firm. That you are not moving. That you have a foundation. So brothers and sisters, not only do we need to have and receive life through love, we also need to be established and have, be firm in love. I started out by asking you guys, have you ever gone to visit someone and they tell you, make yourself at home and you just don't feel at home? 
You try to be comfortable, you have a seat, you have nice conversation, but you don't feel at home. And brothers and sisters, when we came to Jesus, Jesus came into our hearts and Jesus came into our hearts and actually began to live in us, live in our hearts. And brothers and sisters, I'm here to tell you that when that happened, we started changing. But brothers and sisters, many of us have stayed there. We were very happy with inviting Jesus in to the foyer. And saying, look how beautiful my entrance is, Jesus. It starts out by saying, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Dwelling is different than visiting, right? Because even if you visit someone for a few weeks, you're still not at home. Dwelling is living. Now the word of God says that out of the abundance of the heart speaks the mouth. And if Jesus is in my heart, then what should be spoken out of my mouth? So why is it that sometimes we're like, I didn't mean to say that, or it just came out? I'm not saying that Jesus is not in your heart, brother and sister. What I'm saying is that Jesus is not dwelling in your heart. Dwelling is different. Let me tell you, when my wife and I got married and we started living together, there was a lot of things that I thought I knew about my wife. And then only to find out that I was wrong. And I'm pretty sure she felt the same way about me. Like, for example, why does the toilet paper need to go out this way? Why can't it go out that way? But that would not have happened had we not started to dwell together. Had we not dwelled in our home. Here's the thing, brothers and sisters. When Jesus starts dwelling in our hearts through faith, then all of a sudden, things start changing because, not because we want them to change necessarily, but because we feel the need to change. Because let me tell you, before I could tell you that the, I, I, I would justify myself and say, well, that's just my character. And I know that Jesus said, uh, no, it isn't. And I needed to start changing those things, brothers and sisters. And I'm sure that many of us, as we start dwelling and allowing Jesus to dwell in our hearts through faith, all of a sudden we start seeing that there are some things that maybe we need to change. Maybe what I say should not be what I'm saying. Maybe how I act should not be the way I'm acting. And you're saying, well, pastor, you just want us to change completely. You are right. I do want you to change completely. You know why, brothers and sisters? Because when we come to the Lord, it says that we are made into a new creature. We are completely new. We are no longer the old person. So therefore, if we have a new identity when we come to Jesus, we also have a new life. We are no longer that. That's right. I'm not a chicken. I'm an eagle. Brothers and sisters, it is time for us to be rooted 
in love and established in love. We use this word love so easily here in the United States and everywhere around the world that, that it has stopped meaning what it actually means. Stop meaning that we care for people genuinely. Not because they're my relatives or because I know them or because they're my friends or because we're buddies. That's not the only reason why I care for them. I care for them because God cares for them. And I give not because I, I want to give, not because I, I need to give. I give because I see the need that I can actually help with. Because God sees that need too. So brothers and sisters, when we are allowing Jesus to dwell in our hearts through faith, then we could actually start being rooted, receiving life through love and established, being firm in love. We need to receive that life of love. We need to be established. We need to be firm in that love. Because let me tell you, brothers and sisters, when love starts giving us life, which is what Christ is, God is love. When God starts giving us life, when love starts giving us life, then not only is our inner being strengthened, but we can actually start sharing that. We can receive life through love. We can be established in love. Verse 19 says, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge. Now, when I read this, I was like, are you kidding me? How are you going to know something that surpasses knowledge? That just doesn't make sense. You either know it and it exists and you can understand it, or you don't understand it and therefore you don't know it. Right? Thank you for those that are shaking their heads now. <laughs> How can it be possible that we can know love that we can't possibly know? And the best way that I can tell you, brothers and sisters, is that we experience it. We can't understand it. We don't get it, but we experience it. Christ's love was so great for us that he willingly gave himself for us. I don't know about you, brothers and sisters, but when I think about that, when I just think about that statement, that Christ loved me so much, even though I didn't deserve it, even though I was completely lost, even though I knew who I knew who I was, I start experiencing that love. That love that I don't deserve. I start experiencing that love, not just from God, but I start experiencing that love from God's people. And then all of a sudden, my inner being starts being strengthened. 
Then all of a sudden, I start seeing how I can receive life from love. Then all of a sudden, I can start seeing how I can be firm in love. Because even though things may come and go, I can still love someone even though they have failed and failed and failed. Do you know why? Because I have failed and failed and failed. And even so, Jesus said, I'll say, I, like, I got you. I love you. I love you just the way you are, Jose. I love you even though you have fallen. I love you even though you said that thing that you shouldn't have said. I love you even though you acted that way that you shouldn't have acted. I love you even though you didn't do what I asked you to do. I love you. I love you and I love you. And let me tell you, brothers and sisters, there are people that don't know that they are loved like this. We might know this because we hear it, we say it, but brothers and sisters, there are people that don't know that. And you know why they don't know that? Because we haven't taken the step to willingly give ourselves for them. We were very happy when others gave themselves for us. We were very happy when Jesus gave it, uh, himself for us. But we haven't taken the step to do that for others. And you might be saying, well, pastor, you just don't know the people I hang out with. You're right, I don't. But I can tell you that those people that you hang out with are the people that God put around you. And the reason why he put them around you is because you need to start giving yourself willingly for them. And that person that you meet on the street is the same. You need to give yourself for them. And this is exactly what Jesus did. Which is why on the night that he gave himself for us, he took the bread and he broke it and he said to his disciples, take and eat. This is my body. I'm giving myself to you. Take it. I want to be part of you. Then when the supper was over, he took the cup and he said, drink. This is my blood poured out for you. This is the new covenant. A new covenant. No longer the covenant that you had to try your hardest. It's now the covenant that I love you. I love you. And so, Lord, we want to thank you and we ask that through your Holy Spirit you take this gifts of bread and wine and let it be God your body and your blood so that we may be your body for this world so that we may willingly give ourselves for those that you have put around us so that we may be Receiving love, life from love, God, established in love, and so that our inner being may be strengthened because you dwell in us, you are part of us. Brothers and sisters, we're going to be taking communion. I'm going to ask our servers to please come up. And I'm going to ask that as you receive your cup, please wait to be open. Don't open it right away. We're going to take it all together. From the highest of heights, 
to the depths of the sea. Creations revealing your majesty. From the colors of fall to the fragrance of spring. Every creature unique in the song that it sings. All exclaiming, indescribable, uncontainable. You place the stars in the sky and you know them by name. You are amazing God. All powerful, untamable, all struck, we fall to our knees as we humbly proclaim. You are amazing God. You are amazing God. Who has told every lightning bolt where it should go? Or seen heavenly storehouses laden with snow? Who imagine the sun gives source to its light, yet conceals it to bring us the coolness of night, all exclaiming, indescribable, uncontainable, you place the scars in the sky and you know them by name. You are amazing God, all powerful, untamable, all struck, we fall to our knees as we humbly proclaim, you are amazing God. Brothers and sisters, please take your cup and Turn it so that the bread is facing up and open it up. Take the bread, brothers and sisters, the body of Christ given for you. Turn the cup around. Take the juice, brothers and sisters, the cup of salvation. Pour it out for you. Thanks be to God. And as grateful people, let us now come and give thanks through our gifts and our tithes. I'm going to ask our ushers to please come up.
please open your hymnals to hymn number 77, How Great Thou Art. 77. Brothers and sisters, Paul ends this by saying now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we all we ask or imagine. According to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Go out knowing that you are called people. We'll see you next week. God bless you.